Um, I'm really delighted to be here because um, I, I've tried to understand some of the uh, educational responses to epistemological issues, certainly for the last uh, 40 years, and I, I'm still struggling to understand uh, the nature of what is educational. And I'll just take you back to a crucial distinction that I'd like to make in my paper. Um, and it's between the notion of the education researcher and the educational researcher. And I'll just explain why I think the distinction is so important. And it comes out in my studies of the philosophy of education, certainly between 1968 to 70, mm -hmm. where I was introduced to the philosophy of the British mm -hmm. Analytic School of Philosophy at London University's Institute of Education. And I want to focus on what I was told about the nature of educational theory from the philosophers. Because the philosophers held that educational theory was constituted by the philosophy, psychology, sociology, and history of education. And explicitly, as a practicing teacher, I came out of the East End of London twice a week to study philosophy. And what they said to me was that my practical principles, the principles I use, and I hope you can sense as I'm speaking to you, I'm carrying a certain energy. I'm actually expressing that energy. I can't do anything without the expression of energy. And I also believe it's carrying my values, the ones that I hold uh, contribute to the flourishing of humanity. And it's those kinds of values and energy that I use to constitute education. But the philosophers told me that my practical principles were at best, and this is a quote, pragmatic maxims that had a first crude and superficial justification in practice that in any rationally developed theory would be replaced by principles with more theoretical justification, i.e. from the disciplines. Now, do I make sense there in terms of what the philosophers did to my knowledge? that philosophers told me that my knowledge was to be replaced. Yeah? So what I want to do is to make that very clear distinction between the education researcher, and I value enormously insights from the study of philosophy, psychology, sociology. So I don't want to be taken to saying that I want to reject the insights from the disciplines. But what I do reject completely is the idea that educational theory, educational research, can be constituted by the disciplines <coughs> of education. Now, could I just make that as a stipulative expression of meaning? So that is what, I, if you like, my presentation is grounded in, that there is this fundamental distinction. And then what I want to do, and you'll see this in my paper, that um, you can access my paper on the web, and I'll just show you where you can actually access it. If you're going to the uh, what's called actionresearch.net, which is the web page. Uh, on my web page, if you just go up here, you'll find that you can access the paper from the web and you can respond to me, and I'd really appreciate it. If you would, take some time just to respond to me because it takes a little time, as you well know, to read the papers and respond. And you'll also be able to access uh, the Educational Journal of Living Theories, where last year's presentation that I made, I was asked along with the three other presenters, if I put this as the whole issue. And you can access that uh, from that top of my web page. You can get into it, and you can access multimedia accounts of our practice as educational researchers. Now, the reason that I think this is very important about this distinction is if you go into the AERA websites and you access the themes, say, for the last three years. What I'm claiming is that the language of the presidents and the program chairs are literally all focused on the language of the education researcher. That you don't even get educational mentioned. And so if you go into this year's theme, the power of education research for innovation in practice and policy, you go through the whole of the page of the theme and you won't get educational mentioned at all. It is all education research. Now, what I want to claim, and this is quite uh, a painful thing to claim, is that the presidents and the program chairs 
are failing to exercise their responsibilities to educational researchers, just like the philosophers did in the 1970s, to exercise their responsibility to the educational research, because they replaced, in my language, the practical principles of the educational researchers by the theoretical principles of the education researcher. So if you go into all of the themes and all the language, I hope you will do this, because in the paper I've just extracted the three years of the themes and the language to demonstrate that there is like a hegemony at work in terms of the language of the education researcher as distinct from protecting the values and the responsibilities of the educational researcher. Now, could I just ask if I'm being clear about that? Because it seems to me to be such a fundamental issue when you look at the way in which the presidents and the program chairs set out the themes of what is the American Educational Research Association. Now, this isn't just uh, something which is uh, focused on the e American Educational Research Association. One of our former presidents of our British Educational Research Association, um, Jeff Whitty, I, I was president in 1988, and Jeff about five, six years ago. And Jeff is a sociologist of education, was arguing that we should actually think about changing the name of the Educational Research Association, so it became the British Education Research Association because he claimed that education research should define the whole field of which educational research was a part. So am I hopefully making sense here? Uh, so the philosophers early on actually removed the practical principles of the educational practice to actually dominate through the principles of the disciplines. Now what I've tried to do in my paper is first of all establish the language of the presidents of ARA and the program chairs are exercising this hegemony of the education research and the logical language. Then what I do is I go on to go back, I go back to 1993 when Elliot Eisner gave a superb presidential address at AERA arguing that we needed to change and extend the forms of representation that we use. And he used multimedia, he used poetry, he used a video of Teddy Kennedy uh, talking about the poem Ulysses, about his brother uh, John Kennedy's death, and it was a completely different form of representation to, for example, most of the print-based texts that I use in my paper. So in one sense, I'm still a living contradiction. To conform to the requirements of many of the publications, I still publish print-based texts, and yet I know that that is denied, for example, as I'm expressing with you now, the energy flowing values that actually constitute what I understand by educational practice. So there's a fundamental difference I'm claiming needed in that form of representation. And in the paper, I go on to multimedia narratives, and I show where you can access those on the web through that educational journal of living theories, where last year's presentation, uh, we were persuaded to separate it out by the editors of this journal and actually make up a whole issue of the presentation from last year's AERA. And we've done that, and you'll see in there <coughs> values that I imagine you might all hold, but you've never put into your educational research papers. If I give you an example of that. One of my uh, students uh, actually put in a thesis uh, which was called Love at Work. And it was the first time love, as an academic standard, had been brought into the University of Bath. Another was a nurse, a uh, very senior position, um, <coughs> advising the Labour government of the time. She brought in a passion for compassion and showed with videotapes of Alzheimer's patients and carers, all fulfilling the ethics, uh, that the notion of a passion for compassion could be communicated in its embodied sense, just as I hope you'll fail that I actually, I do love what I do, and I love coming to ARA, because it allows me the chance to put forward some of the <coughs> ideas and then share them and hopefully get some responses. Now you'll see in that paper from last year, and I put this into my paper for this year, that the value of being loved into learning, being loved into learning is a value, an embodied value, that two of the master's students, being supervised by a former superintendent of schools, it was my PhD student, actually surprised her last year, they surprised my student, the superintendent, by saying, well look, the fundamental quality we experienced from you was actually being loved into learning. Now that really surprised, the superintendent was called Jackie DeLong, 
It surprised Jackie DeLong because she had never ever thought of herself in those ways, of expressing this sense of the love for what she was doing and her students. And these two women, in their masters, had acknowledged, and in the paper from last year, and we put it into my paper this year, that they experienced this being loved into learning as crucial in their expression of their originality for their master's degree. Now, if you try to put into an academic text in your universities or schools that idea of being loved into learning, all I'm saying is I think you'd still find that the print-based text, the dominance of the education researcher, would actually eliminate those kinds of expressions from your discourse. <coughs> and the other thing that I've noticed, and it's still unfortunately happening, is if you ask a question, and I think everybody here will have asked this question of themselves in your practice, I think this question, how do I improve what I'm doing? This idea that you've got values, and sometimes in your practice you're feeling you're not living your values as fully as can, therefore you'll ask that kind of question, how do I improve my practice? The I is actually really important. Now, this was in 91, I had the first shock when a research committee at Kingston University in the UK asked for the I to be removed from the inquiry. Right? Now, I don't know if you can feel how literally foolish that that is. If you have an inquiry, how do I improve my practice? And you're asked to take the eye out of it. Do, you know, what are they doing to your inquiry? Now, gradually, we got to the point of showing how that was unethical, that the power relation of the research committee was being exercised in an unethical way. But this happened in a northern university in the UK three years ago. The same thing. Yep. Three. Three minutes. The, the personal pronoun I, there, and it's in writing this, the student asked to remove the personal pronoun. Now, it's these points that are still relevant 30 years after the philosophers were saying, and they acknowledged in 1983, that they'd made a mistake. In 1983, it was Paul Hurst who said, look, that was a mistake to say that the practical principles of people like ourselves should be replaced. He, he then really focused on justifying what it was that practitioners were doing in practice. But until then, you can imagine, the 1960s, the 70s, up to 83, people like myself have been subjected to that kind of power to remove not only the eye, but also the sense of every practical principle that I held and the passion with which I held it should be replaced. So what I've done in the third part of the paper is to actually show you how over a period of some 20 odd years, uh, I think we're now over about 38 to 40, uh, what we call living theory doctrines, that is, people that have studied their own practice, they've built up validated explanations of their educational influences in learning, we call those explanations living theories, to distinguish them from the theories that you're used to in the philosophy, psychology, sociology. Are you okay with this, where the explanations are derived from general abstract principles to apply to individual case? Whereas with the living theory, it's the individuals. It's you and I preparing and producing validated explanations of our influence, both in our own learning, the learning of others, and also the learning of the social formations in which we live and work. Now, I've tried to put those in the third part of my paper with the access on the internet, because the evidence of what I'm saying to support that is actually on the internet. Is that, is that okay, just for the moment? And then if you've got any questions after, you know, our four speakers, then we can actually think about those. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks.